quite a techno was these days, Leo, eh? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, not quite, but we're here with Greg Turner, four-time winner on the European Tour, two-time New Zealand Open winner, and of course, a member of that famous 1998 President's Cup winning side. Uh, Greg, thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, really appreciate you, you being with us. How's, how's the Turner bubble going down in uh, Aratown at the moment? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an unusual set of circumstances, isn't it? I, um, um, well, I don't think any of us have, have um, endured or, or been through something like this. So no, we're we're pretty lucky. I mean, Aratown's not a bad spot to be. Um, we've had the kids home and um, made a bit of a little golf green in the backyard. We've been having chipping contests every night, um, which I'm pleased to say that I, I'm ahead of I'm ahead of my son at the moment. <laughs> but um, yeah, doing lots of walking and and just slowing down a bit. They give, a bit of time to reflect and that's probably not a bad thing your your kids um obviously i've got the kids home as well probably a little younger than your kids uh, we've been homeschooling four of them today by 10 o'clock i had three in detention and by midday i'd expelled one of them so uh it, it sounds <laughs> like your bubble might be going a little bit uh a little bit better than my bubble well my son just cooked as um uh, a uh, french onion soup for lunch and my daughter's away at the supermarket picking up the, um, um, among other things, um, four six packs of Guinness. So uh, I think I'm definitely in a slightly better spot than you. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Greg, the, the idea of these interviews, I guess, is to largely connect with our membership, keep them engaged, and also the friends of Paraparamu Beach. But on the other hand, we also um, want to take this opportunity to reconnect with, with golfers that I guess have shared a special relationship with Paraparamu Beach over the years, um, have gone on to either bigger or better things. And we'd like to hear a little bit about uh, your golfing journey and perhaps how Paraparamu Beach has helped you um, maybe grow, grow your love of the game. So um, over the course of the interview, that's where I hope to take a, take a few of these things. Um, but hey, let's, let's, let's start off right back at the beginning, Greg, where it, where it began and, and you were born into what could be argued a very talented sporting Dunedin family. Uh, your brother, obviously quite a famous cricketer representing New Zealand, and you had another brother that was uh, representing New Zealand in hockey. How did you gravitate with that in the family? How did, how did you actually gravitate towards golf? Well, yeah, I mean, I sometimes joke, I feel like I had sort of three fathers rather than two brothers. Um, Glenn, they're sort of 16 and 20 years older than me. So um, I, it'd be fair to say there wasn't a lot of backyard cricket played um, with me. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess I just grew up in an environment where excelling at sport was normal. So um, I suspect that had an impact in terms of, um, you know, making or, or, or making me feel that, um, that, that excelling was possible. Um, um, you know, I think you know, there's a big hurdle to overcome when you're a young person um, in terms of, uh, you know, wondering whether you could ever be good enough to, to, you know, to achieve an elite sport. And I guess that was removed from me a bit because it was sort of in the family anyway. Um, you know, I can, I sometimes joke a bit about, I get asked why I play golf. And uh, I remember Glenn coming back from a tour of the West Indies and I would have been, oh, I guess I was maybe 10 or 11 or something like that. Um, and, uh, and he'd had four double hundreds in that tour and, um, and, you know, against a pretty fearsome West Indies bowling attack. And he was getting changed to go and play cricket for Green Island because that's what you did in those days. <laughs> you played club cricket as well. And, uh, and I wandered into the room and he was getting changed anyway. He was absolutely black and blue. I mean, he'd been pummeled. He'd batted for hours against that West Indian attack. And, I mean, he was bruised beyond belief. And, um, and I think it occurred to me at the time, shit, if that's what you get when you're really good, <laughs> maybe I'll play golf <laughs> but um, yeah so so you know being sort of effectively an only child but with it in a from an environment where sport selling and sport was was kind of normal um, I, you know I think golf um, you know was something I could do I could do on my own um, my best mate at high school a guy I'd never met before was a guy David Skeggs his old man was the, happened to be the mayor at the time which was handy um, and he played golf. So we used to, used to take me out and we'd go and started playing golf together when I was about, I guess that was at Bate High School when I was about 13. So, um, but in those days you played all sports. Um, but I, so I still played a lot of cricket and a lot of hockey and some soccer and a bit of tennis. And, um, but golf was sort of the thing that was easiest to do on your own, really. So one thing 
one thing that's quite evident these days, I mean, you've, you've just talked about starting golf at 13, and I know a lot of people of your generation uh, started around 13 and 14, because I guess you couldn't get into golf clubs before then. What, what do you think about kids these days, you know, starting at six and seven and eight? Um, uh, look, I, I mean, I think, I think it's great that, that kids have got the opportunity to start at an early age. That said, I don't think that means you've got to push them uh, at an early age. Or an, and I don't think it's... Um, and in general, I think trying to get kids to specialise too young is a mistake. I think that they're an awful... It's an awfully broad range of skills um, and talents that ultimately might lead you to become successful at any given sport. And, and I think that they evolve from, from all sorts of areas. Um, you know, for every time you see a Tiger Woods or someone like that, who knows how many young um, kids might have turned into great players if they hadn't been pushed so hard, if they'd been given an opportunity to have a more balanced and a broader sort of um, experience in sport. I think sport's great. Um, and and I'm certainly with our kids, we've encouraged them to play all sorts of sports. But um, and, and, and they'll, you know, for my money, they'll specialise when they're ready to specialise, when they want to specialise. But, you know, the stuff you can learn, um, you know, playing team sports, for instance, um, is still going to stand you in good stead on a golf course in the future if that's where you're going to end up. So um, I, don't think, I don't think you can ever start too young, but I, but I hate to see uh, kids getting pushed too hard too soon. So in terms of, so you started at 13, in terms of your amateur career, um, you know, did you play in club championships? Did you make representative sides uh, for Otago at that stage? I mean, what was your, what was your first handicap? How, how did you, how quickly did you progress? Yeah, my first, first handicap I, I had was seven. Um, that's yeah. the highest I've ever been on. So, uh, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I was, a quick learner, I think. I was always, you know, I played a bit before I got a handicap. I, I joined up at Bell Nows, which is a nine-hole course on the hill near Otago Boys. And we used to play there a bit and we'd go to Chisholm, but, um, um, but we never really put any cards in. We just, you know, played around. And it wasn't until I joined Bell Mac when I suppose I was um, the Otago Golf Club. It is, of course, when I was I'm, I'm, I'm probably late 14, about 14, that I got a handicap. Yeah, so seven was um, as high as I've ever been. But... Um, uh, so I can't remember the first representative team I had. Otago had a really good, really strong team in those days. Um, you know, we had guys like Jeff Clark and, and Ronnie Johnson and um, uh, Brian Newell and Mike Atkinson and John Finn and John Sanders. And, you know, there was a, a whole heap of really good players. So it was a hard team to get into, but it was a good team to, you know, it was good to be around um, uh, guys that were really top amateurs. In fact, I can remember my first, I'm pretty sure my first New Zealand amateur, funnily enough, was at Parapran Beach. And um, and and I probably must have been only 16 or 17. And they used to have the New Zealand foursomes um, was on the day before. And um, and I got to partner Jeff Clark, who was one of the top amateurs in the country at the time. And that was a huge um, uh, thrill for a young fella, um, you know, around around a course like Paraparam, which is, you know, which straight away became one of my favourites and still is to this day. So, um, funny how those little connections evolved. Yeah, yeah that would, uh, I'm trying to think who won that year. Was that the late 70s, it would have been? I think, I, yeah, I think, I think John Durry. It might have John Durry, yeah. John Durry would have won. Pretty sure John Durry beat John Finn in the final, okay. uh, I think. Okay. Um, I wasn't around for the final. <laughs> um, but, uh yeah, it was a it was a great experience, and and you know, and I and I can I can well remember really looking forward to to going and, and playing Paraparam Beach. That um, I played quite a bit at Chisholm um, in Dunedin, so um, sort of developed a bit of a love of links golf anyway. So and Paraparam was was then and still probably is regarded as as um, yeah, you know, well, you know, along with Terry Eady as the two finest sort of links in the country, and um, and uh, yeah, it was a real um, an eye opener is the wrong word, but I mean, I think that cemented um, a love for Lynx golf, which has, has endured to, to, to this day, really. How quickly did you turn professional? I went to university in the States. I, went, uh, I got a college scholarship, and um, so I didn't turn, uh, I turned professional straight after the World Amateur, the um, Eisenhower Trophy. Was, uh, I was in the, I played two of those. One when I was 
my first year at college and then um, in Hong Kong. Um, and that was in 84. Uh, and that was sort of November 84, so I was 21. Um, and I turned pro straight after that. Yeah, okay, okay. Good. First time, obviously, I met you, Greg, was uh, we walked around Mount Monganui Golf Club together. I was a superintendent <laughs> there. And I think that was where you had your first tournament victory, was it? Or your first yeah. official victory? My first, first tournaments I played were I played a, um, the uh, airlines tournament at. Um, Titarangi was my first tournament as a pro, and then I'm pretty sure it was at Paraparam in the New Zealand Open. And I'm trying to think, you were 84, that might have been, would that have been Corey Pavin? Corey Pavin won in 84, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah okay. So, um, yeah, and then, um, and then the old PJ at the Mount, which was played over New Year, finished on New Year's Day. Um, yeah, right, cool. yeah. yeah so, and that was so that. So you ended up was, on, the, on the European tour. Um, and I'm thinking if you turned pro in, in 84, and I, and I know you won a tournament in 86, that was a fairly uh, quick ascent. Um, these days, you know, it can be a lot, a lot harder, I guess, and a lot longer to, to establish yourself on the tour. What was the pathway between, between turning professional and, and, and winning your first event? Yeah, well, those, I mean, those, you know, in those days, <laughs> you, uh, you sort of played, you played, well, the Australasian tour was a lot longer. We had you know, a lot of state opens, and I think from memory, I want to say we had about 14 or 16 weeks in, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, there was the PGA and New Zealand Open and the airlines in New Zealand. And then, um, and actually, I remember going after that. This is how sort of naive I was a little bit. Um, after winning the PGA, I went over to Tasmania Open. It was a couple of weeks later. And I would, and I pre, went pre-qualified at, I think it was Devonport Golf Club from memory. Anyway, um, I got through the pre-qualifying all right, which was always a bit of a, you know, the 18 hole pre-qualifying is a bit of a shootout. And uh, when I was uh, coming out of the office after signing my card, the guy who was the chairman of the, or the secretary of the PGA at the time said to me, oh, why did you qualify today? You, that New Zealand PGA, you won the PGA, that makes you exempt. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so anyway, um, so no, I went played, played Australia and then sort of the pathway from there was to go up to Asia. It was a nine, nine-week tour of, of Asia. Um, were, were you doing this with other, other Kiwis at the time or other Australasian mates? Yeah, or? Plenty of Kiwis. There were lots of Kiwis playing then. Um, you know, Frank Nobolo was a good, good player then. There was, um, you know, Simon Owen was still playing quite a bit. Um, uh, Stewie Reese and, um, um, and, oh, gosh, I'm trying to think of else. There was, there was a bunch of Kiwis. Richard Coombs was playing a lot. You know, you, you could sort of play Australia and... and, and to a lesser extent, Asia, and from being a club pro in those days too. Um, not so many up in Asia. I think there was just myself and Frank and, and a few of the Aussie boys. But the fir- first tournament on that Asian tour was was the Hong Kong Open. And I um, finished fourth in the World Amateur there, the Eisenhower, in, in November. So um, they were kind enough to give me an invite. Um, and again, because qualifying, it was Monday qualifying, the old days where you, if you made the cut, you were in the next week. If you missed the cut, you went ahead and you had pre qualify on the Monday. And, um, and that was a you know Asian tour was lots of guys out of America and Australia and, and from all over the place there was some Swedes and um, it was pretty competitive um, so it was good to get a, an invite first week and I made the cut um, and so they got me in in Malaysia and I played pretty nicely from memory I think in Malaysia I finished um, I think I finished sixth or seventh um, and then uh, and then we went off to Thailand and I played okay and then to India. Um, and then came back to Singapore, and I finished lost in a playoff in Singapore. So um, um, uh, that was that was what did you know I did well enough in those first few weeks to get my exempt for the rest of the tour. And, um, um, so that you know that was a real help. You know, little things make a big difference. And you know, I sometimes say this to people when they look at young guys these days, man, you just need a break at the right time, and you can't underestimate how one break sometimes. If I hadn't got that invite into Hong Kong, maybe I would have missed the cut. If I'd have missed the cut there would I have got in the next week? And, you know, the whole story might be different. So, so anyway, that was Asia. And then we sort of played in around the Pacific Islands. And, um, and then I went off to the tour school, school in Europe. And um, the plan was, in those, it, my plan was to see if I, if I get my card in Europe, to play a couple of years in Europe and then, uh, and then go back to America. Um, and I, I played nicely in tour school in Europe, finished third, I think, behind a, Eliza Bell won. He turned out to be not a bad player. Yeah. And um, an Argentinian guy, Adam Sauer, who was a good player too. Um, anyway, um, 
got my card in, in Europe. Then it was back down to Australia and played Australia Asia again and was lucky enough um, uh, to win in Singapore. So I'd, I'd lost my play off the year before, won in Singapore. Um, so that sort of gave me some good momentum to carry forward into Europe. And then, um, you know, I was lucky enough in my first season in Europe to win um, as a rookie in Scandinavia, beat um, Scandinavia. Craig Stadler in a play. Yeah, um, that. So that kind of got me established there. So, um, so all in all, I had a pretty, um, you know, relatively smooth ride, I suppose. And then it looks like from 86 through to, through to 89 that the, that the career kind of stalled a little bit. Uh, you arrived <laughs> back... You arrived back in New Zealand in 89 at Titarangi and you, you missed the cut there at the in New Zealand Shell Open. Do you, do you remember that? Well, I don't, but, um, but I'm sure you're right. Yeah, no, I, I, I played okay sort of through 87. Not great, but then it really went downhill. Um, had a long period of playing, um, playing pretty, pretty poorly. Um, yeah, so 80, 89, I, I decided in 89 that I needed I kind of got completely lost with the golf swing. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and I, it was about the time that um, Faldo was just starting to really shine, um, having gone um, um, through that Leadbetter, um, sort of David Leadbetter school, I guess. It was right in a big transition was happening in golf, um, uh, in technique-wise. I mean, I think the high-speed camera and, and had kind of um, proven that a few of the the, the foundations upon which technique, I guess, had been built um, weren't accurate. Um, you know, it had always sort of been thought that swing path was the the most important factor in, in determining outcome. And, and the high-speed camera kind of proved that actually it was club face that was more important than path. And and the knock-on of that was a complete change, really, in the attitude to the way you 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 wanted to swing the club. You wanted to be a lot more rot by being more rotational. You could hold that club face squarer for longer, um, and it sort of and it, it turned out that that was more important than trying to keep the club path on the line. Um, so I went through a really big transition. I worked with David Lebet, his partner, a guy named Dennis Pugh um, in Britain, and he completely tore the old swing up. And um, basically, I can remember it, nothing is belittling. He said he looked. He looked at the swing and I said, well, what do you think? And, uh, and, he, and he said, well, tell me what you've been working on, what you've been trying to do. And, da, da, da. and he said, well, we've got two choices. I can either try and take you back to where you were um, or we can try and go forward to something completely different. And I said, well, you know, which is, <laughs> which is going to be easier? He said, well, I think it's, it's just as far back as it is forward. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, we sort of made the decision to throw out the old, um, the old sort of swing, which was a, completely had to rebuild my thinking about what had to happen in the golf swing. So it was a huge, I think Dennis to this day, I'll probably tell you, I, I probably made the biggest transition in terms of technique of anybody he'd ever worked with. So, um, but it was pretty humiliating for a start. I remember going, the first session I had with him after the, first, after the initial one, when he looked at the swing, when we started working on it, we went, it was the week of the British PGA and we went um, down, or the week after the British PGA, and we went down to the, the practice fairway at the back end of, um, went with so they could be on our own because I was literally just hitting shanks and tops and I mean it was it was pretty painful and um, just as we'd started um, Feldo turned up with a film crew from Golf Digest he just won the PGA and he won the Masters and <laughs> and they were filming for a, for a thing and so there was Feldo standing alongside me just flushing these making perfect swings and hitting these frozen ropes and there was me hitting tops and shanks and <laughs> right, right. so uh, my, Dennis said to me afterwards he said look he said you've proved a lot to me he said if you could stand there and have the discipline and the um, humility to deal to, 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 to deal to do that to go through that then um, then I reckon you're going to be all right and uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway it was pretty bad for a while um, and but I lost the card in Europe that right. year and so I came back to New Zealand and I was starting to play a little bit better, but not, um, I was still a long, long, long way away from feeling like I knew what I was doing with the swing. Um, but um, yeah, I turned up a pair for Ram on. Obviously, of course, I really liked them. Uh, you know, the field was probably a bit weaker that year than it had been. Um, and I played okay and, uh, and managed to get myself into, and with a chance um, on Sunday. And, um, 
yeah, and I, and, you know, it, uh, I was lucky on Sunday. The weather was absolutely perfect. Uh, it basically didn't blow a breath. All I could do was hit 30-yard cuts. <laughs> that was kind of the only thing in the arsenal um, um, with the with the big swing changes I've been working on. But um, And that would have been a real problem if it had been windy, um, but it wasn't. Um, and um, and I played a pretty good – I think I, from memory, I think I might have shot 66 in the last round and um, yeah. and ended up winning by – um, four or five or something, and that, uh, and what a huge, you know, and with the benefit of hindsight, that was a massive, um, you know, if you had to pick a moment, I guess, in my career, you know, things were looking pretty bleak. And well, you, were, um, you, you were quoted in the newspaper following that win, saying that it was, it was, you were pretty much ready to give the game away, and if you, if you hadn't, if you hadn't <laughs> well, won that, I was, it, yeah, yeah, I was definitely broke, um, and I'd. Um, and I was heading off back to the tour school. If I hadn't have made my card at the tour school, I, you know, that could well have been, um, oh, well, that might have been it. As it turned out, um, as I won there and then that then went back to uh, play the World Cup, um, which was in Spain with um, Simon um, Owen. And I think we finished sixth or seventh, which made a few bob. Um, uh, and then went off to the tour school and got my card back. And, and um, yeah, and, and sort of, that was the sort of rebirth of my career a little bit, if you like. So, so it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's an interesting. I mean, obviously, from... obviously, I met you formally in, in 2005 when we walked around Mount Monganui together, but uh, but I'd been stalking you for several, several years previous to that, Greg. <laughs> and I was just a young fella um, during those you know wonderful years we had at Paraparama when the New Zealand Open was, was almost in town every year and it was a regular, a regular fixture. And... Um, I was part of that crowd, and I mean, I was, I was a big Frank Noblo fan as well. And uh, I think, uh, like a lot of that gallery, you know, Frank had a lot of people riding on his on his shoulders that day, and uh, desperate for a New Zealander to to, to to win the event again. And uh, there was this famous twelve minutes which occurred uh, with Frank on the fifth hole and you on the seventh hole, which absolutely turned the turned the tournament upside down. Frank, of course, went side to side and walked off with a triple bogey at the same time that you had just uh, sunk a birdie on seven. And, and there was a, there was a five shot swing happened, uh, you know, in the space over a couple of holes, but it was those 12 minutes of, um, that, that really flipped <laughs> yeah. it on its head. Yeah. I was kind of oblivious cause I was a couple behind and I, and I'd started. Okay. I think I birdied. Oh, I might've birdied a couple of holes early. I think I, two, two, I think I might've. Okay. Yeah. Two two, two, all right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, I had a couple of birdies, and then um, you know, there was a big crowd following Frank. There wasn't a lot of people following us from memory, and um, yeah, and I remember going down seven, and all of a sudden, this sort of the, a lot of the crowd. <laughs> there was quite an influx of people, and I thought, and I made birdie there, and I thought, oh, I must be, I must be pretty close. And I remember getting there was a scoreboard at the back of the eighth green, and uh, and I looked up there, and I and I had a, I think I had a four shot lead. From memory, I mean, it was it was it yeah, was five shots. You know, I'd gone. Yeah, it was a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think it might have been four. That, anyway, sorry, you're right. So, yeah. And um, and it was like wow, you know, um, and, and that's a kind of an interesting, uh, you know, an interesting position because you're sort of on the one hand you don't want to be looking at the scoreboard and and, but on the other hand it's quite a change from going from chasing to being four in front. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I can and I remember on nine, um, the pin was right up the back on nine, and uh, and I, I was just in the rough off the tee, and um, and I thought, oh, don't be silly, don't be hitting at this flag, um, you know, there's it's there was a bloody out of bounds up there and water and and um, yeah, it's pretty narrow right at the back of that green, yeah, yeah. and I just hit it in the middle of the green and. And I got it just came out a little bit hot, and I guess I was a little bit of a drill, and that thing came up to about three feet from the hole. Yeah. <laughs> and I tapped that in for birdie, and and everybody's oh, what a brave shot that was! And yeah, it wasn't brave at all; it was a flyer. <laughs> it was um, but, um, interesting yeah. just pouring over some of the news articles of of that event, um, looking at what clubs what clubs were getting played, and and the seventeenth hole, for example, you'd had a you'd had a triple bogey in the second round. And that's quite fascinating. I mean, you've gone on to win a tournament by six shots and you had a, had a triple bogey in the second round on 17. You had a two iron, a two iron second shot to the right-hand side of the green and failed to get up a couple of times. Um, yeah, amazing. Yeah. You hadn't, you know, yeah. 
Well, it was, it was interesting. It was, I was I was talking to, um, funnily enough, I was having a conversation with Steve Williams um, down at the New Zealand Open recently, and we were just, you know, he was caddying for Ryan Fox, of course, and and um, and he told the story about, um, uh, you know, when he first went out there, he, he got to caddy for Peter Thompson um, early on. Uh, I don't know, over, how, it was over a number of events. He said, but he he said, I well remember, 160 yards was a four iron, Peter. Um, so that's 145, 100 meters, you know. He said, yeah. well, he said, uh, you know, he said, that's a wedge for Foxy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's interesting just watching some of the Masters reruns over the weekend. And, you know, seeing Jack Nicholas was hitting a five iron into 18, uh, which is now, that's kind of, they had a wedge to nine iron in there these days. Um, and and probably the tee is probably thirty yards back from where it was. Too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it's it's extraordinary. I mean, uh, and um, how much you know, and, and you know, it's like anything. It's you know, when things happen in, in small increments, you kind of don't notice so much. And sometimes it takes a, you know a look, you know, quite a long way back. I remember the first time it really came home to me on what had changed. And it wasn't so much in distance, but um, we played uh, in the early days in Europe. We played the Irish Open at Port Marnock. Um, um, many years and there's a par three there i, I want to say it's like 15 um along the coast and uh narrow green and and the beach sort of dunes and beach on the right and the wind used to blow quite hard um either off the sea or the other way and and when it blew the other way oh you, know, you used to stand up there and you used to have to aim this damn thing with a, the old pro tredge type list um you used to aim this thing sort of 20 yards left of the green and just pray that it would hang on and uh and uh, you know we hadn't been there in about ten years, and and I got up there in the in the event, you know, and this and now we had the you know the Pro V ones and whatever, you, and it was howling off the left, um, and you were aiming at the left edge of the green, and then just praying that it would fall right, and uh, oh. and it was like that's how much difference. So it wasn't only the distance, but you know the way the ball travels through the wind now, you know, you know just uh, just the aerodynamics of it. I'm damned if I know how how they do it, but. Um, but, you know, it just does not move in the air anything like it used to. And, and as a consequence, you can't actually hit as many golf shots as you used to. You can't, you know, that was a, obviously the amount it moved in the air was, could be a problem, but could also be a blessing if you were having to try and hit a cut up or, you know, just trying to work the ball on the breeze. But, um, you know, that shot's not really part of the arsenal anymore because the equipment doesn't really, really, um, really allow you to do it. Right. Right. So, so, so you won 89 almost a catalyst for, for turning things around. You've, you, you then went through a, quite a purple patch. You won the Johnny Walker Classic. Um, was that at Melbourne? Was that at Royal Melbourne? It was, was yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And, then, and then you went on in, in 91, you won or you found yourself, uh, you did win, but you found yourself in the final pairing with the world's number one golfer, Greg Norman, at the Diakio Palm Meadows Classic. Tell us a bit about, like, growing up, the Shark was one of my favourites. I'll put a disclaimer out there. Um, <laughs> fascinating, fascinating ball striker. Uh, he has an amazing presence. Uh, what was it like standing on that first tee with the world's number one golfer? Yeah, look, it was it was interesting. Um, you know, that was a purple patch for golf in Australia as well. There was, you know, there was a bunch of money flooding in from the Japanese market. You know, the Japanese had opened resorts. You know, Palm Meadows, Sanctuary Cove, the Vines were all um, Japanese money, um, and yeah, they were pouring a lot of money into events we were playing for what at the time was, um, you know, seemed like a fortune. You know, it was well over a million Australian dollars, I think, each of those events. Um, and, you know, even back in the early 90s, that was a that was a truckload of cash. So so as a consequence, you had, you know, um, you know, we probably had 10 of the top 20 players in the world came down for for the likes of Johnny Walker and Palm Meadows. There was, there was obviously the top Australians, you know, guys like Norman and David Graham and... Um, but you know the um, you know Faldos and Woosnams and I mean Raymond Floyd I think was there from memory and Curtis Strain you know they, you know those were sort of names that, that yeah. travelled um, so yeah I'd, I'd had a really good win and um, at, at Johnny Walker um, you know Royal Melbourne is again it's always been just you know one of my absolute favourite golf courses so so you know to win around a course like that was um, you know very. Uh, pleasing, and also to win against the field like that. Uh, I hadn't been expected to win there, um, but I was playing okay, and um, and I played really nicely the last day, especially, and and won that in, in the end relatively comfortably. I think from 
it was like Ian Baker Finch and I came down the stretch there and he had a bit of a disaster the last few holes and um and uh yeah so so I went in you know that was there when we broke for Christmas and then went into Palm Meadows um so I still feeling pretty good um yeah. you know I'd sort of last start win it's always nice against a field like that yeah. and I remember I shot 74 in the first round and and um and actually played okay and you know cut was going to be level one under or something it was you know of course wasn't difficult and then I shot 62 on um wow. on Friday and it was again it was really strange because you know sitting in the press center afterwards so someone well, how, you know, how did you manage to turn it around so much and I was, you know and it's, it's a funny game golf I said well look to, to be frank um I didn't play that differently I, I mean yesterday I hit I hit three bad tee shots all of them ended up dead, you know, um, and I made um, two bogeys and a double out of them. And um, and today I had three bad tee shots and all of them ended up okay and I made two birdies uh, off of them, um, you know, and, and got on a roll and, uh, you know, instead I hit the lip four or five times yesterday and every time it looked like hitting the lip today it went in and, you know, and it's hard to explain to people how that haven't been there how, you know, how one day can be two over and the next day can be ten under and, uh, <laughs> and they're not... Yeah, you know, that different. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, uh, so I, I was still man. I was, you know, um, I don't know what world ranking I would have been, 150 or 200 in the world. And uh, and I'm playing with Norman on the Saturday, and of course he's a um, Queensland boy, so the local hero and and the best player in the world at the time, you know, easily. Um, uh, you know, as, as you say, one of the most impressive ball strikers of all time, probably. Um, and we got <laughs> if we get on the first tee. And, you know, the first tee, it, it pretty much, it's the same every week. You know, you go to the score and you get your card and and then you and your pin sheet and then you go over and you trade cards with the guy you're playing with. You know, I mean, that's sort of, um, and I remember, and I got, you know, I was a bit pretty nervous playing with Greg and a um, huge crowd and, and, uh, and I went over to exchange cards and he looked at me with those blue eyes, steel blue eyes and, and said, I'll, swap cards with you when I'm ready to swap cards with you and turn his back and, uh, and I just thought wow that's uh, uh and I went to my caddy who's uh, and uh, got him Alice to Musgrove I said wow I said I told him what had happened I said why is Greg Norman worried about me yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so yeah he I guess he was trying to intimidate and um he didn't need to intimidate me he was <laughs> he was intimidating enough but yeah but I actually got quite a kick out of it I, for me that was sort of almost a um yeah, that gave me a little bit of confidence. Um, you know, I sort of felt like, well, you know, maybe I'm better than, um, you know, if, if I'm good enough to, for Greg Norman to be worried, then um, then that's a pretty good sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and in the end, I, in the end I, you know, I think I won, um, I think I won that by four as well. Um, yeah. So um, it was a good few weeks. That, that'd be a good cushion coming down the 18th. There's a lot of water down there from memory. Well, it was funny because Roger Davis was actually playing in front of us um, and he was running second and, you know, yeah, and it's a par five over water and... and uh, double carry or something so, it might be as well. It might, might be a, it might be a double carry. Uh, well, a double carry for a bogey golfer, but uh, there, there's a fair bit of intimidation. Basically, yeah. If you, wanted to, if you wanted to get to the green in two, you had to take it over the water and it wasn't a long carry. Um, but it was, um, you know, it was... It was yeah, it was far enough that you didn't want to miss it. Um, and that would give you the opportunity to go up the green, which is, again, across the water. And, um, and uh, you know, four shots sounds like a lot. <laughs> but I just thought, well, the only way, the only way you can not win this, I mean, you know, it's possible that Davis was going to, could have made Eagle in front. So, so um, you know, six was a winning, uh, you know, I had to make six um, to be sure. And uh, I thought the only way, the only way, you, the only way you can, screw this up is to try and hit it across the water and and yeah completely miss it and hit it in the, in the drink and then you're on the tee playing three and then all of a sudden you know then you're a complete idiot so don't be an idiot so I just had an iron down the left side and I got a bit of stick the crowd gave me a bit of stick you know about um not uh yeah about being a bit of a pussy hitting it down the left and I said to my caddy I'm here yeah I'll be the, I'm happy to be the pussy with the winner's chair yeah, <laughs> at the end fair of it enough. and yeah I laid it up and and hit it on, and, and as it turned out, Davis only made par anyway. So, um, but yeah, no, I've uh, you, you know, and never count your chickens. I, I remember, I remember the, the New Zealand Open. I won it um, at uh, at what's now Royal Auckland, Middlemore. Um, I, I had a pretty 
I think I had a four or five, might have been a four shot lead standing on 18 there, but I wasn't, I wasn't going to smile until I hit it down the fairway there again with the out of bounds yeah. on the right. Oh yeah, I, I, saw a New Zealand, I saw a New Zealand Open winner put it out of bounds on, on 18 at Middlemore 2003. He still won, thankfully. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so golf, golf's largely an individual sport, but, but obviously on occasions you've got to represent your country. Uh, through the World Cup of Golf and uh, the Alfred Dunhill as well. Uh, yeah, there's there's a little um, piece of advice I heard you mention on a, on an interview a number of years ago, which has since become known as the Turner Tip. And I've <laughs> used it on a couple of occasions, firstly for myself, but I've I've also been fortunate to caddy uh, for a couple of, of events at your your new course, Tara Eddy. And uh, they had a member guest event there, and the person I was caddying for was actually Tom. Tom Doak, and he had a uh, he was he was going quite deep into into this into this member guest event, and a lot of uh, people that were finishing were coming in to spectate, and I thought it'd be a really proud moment for Tom, you know, on his course, leading his event to have all these people coming in and, and watching him, but he, he was getting incredibly nervous, uh, getting incredibly nervous. The, the more matches finished and the more people turned up, so I. I, uh, I, I imparted a little tip uh, to him that I'd, I'd learned off you. And, and when he, he sunk a, a clutch putt to win his match, he turned around and he said, thanks for the turn of tip. Now, <laughs> I believe that came from, uh, was it the Alfred Dunhill or the World Cup? But you're, you're at St. Andrews and you're on the 18th and you were standing over a, a, a modest putt yourself. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not sure exactly what the tip was, to be honest, but I can tell you the story. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, no, Dunhill Cup, we were playing um, um, South Africa in the, in the semi-final um, to see who went out and uh, to play. I think, I think Australia might have been playing the other semi against the United States. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd always had a um, pretty decent reputation in terms of as a, you know, I had a pretty good record when I was in front. I think I had seven. I think I think I, I'm pretty sure I led seven times going in the last round, and, and was fortunate enough to win each, win each time. So, so the sort of the um, yeah, you know, the word goes doesn't go around, but you know, people you, you you get a bit of a reputation as being a good finisher, a good closer, and and that's kind of helpful when you're in that situation because the guys you're playing against probably know that you're you've got a reputation as a good closer. So. Um, so that can, I guess, um, well, intimidating is probably not the right, right word, but um, that can have an impact. Um, and so anyway, I was, we were on, I was playing Retief Houston actually. And, and I think from memory, Frank had got beaten by Ernie Else and, and Grant Waite, I think, was our third. And he'd beaten um, Wayne Westner, I think it was. Anyway. Uh, so I came down to my match and I had this sort of, I had the Doug Sanders part. Yep. Uh, interesting, I think Doug just passed away yesterday or the day before. Oh, sad yeah, news to sadly, you. yeah. yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so for, for those who, who can remember, you, Doug had that sort of three and a half, four footer downhill left right on the 18th green to um, to win the Open to beat Nicholas and, and famously missed it. And, and, I, and I had that part. It was sort of a, you know, it was... Left edge, just outside left down. I mean, if, and if you want an intimidating place to to have a pretty significant putt to hold, then 18th green at the old course is um, is probably about as intimidating as it gets. And yeah, and I th and and it, yeah, and then you, then you're in a team event, and you're um, you know, you so see you're you're representing your country, you've got your teammates, and um, so the whole yeah, it, it was a pretty um intense moment I guess and I remember standing over that putt and looking down and the putter head was 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 shimmering shaking and I remember chuckling I laughed I pulled away and had a little laugh to myself I said well if you if you if the putter wasn't shaking a bit at the moment then you wouldn't be human would you and uh, okay you know so that's okay and you know what to do go through your pro your, your routines and and take a few deep breaths and recognize that that's exactly what ought to happen and um and uh, anyway, I you know was fortunate enough to make the putt, and um, yeah, I'm not sure what the tip was that came out of that, but <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the turn of tip. It was it was a game just just channeling those nerves uh, positively. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm a great believer in in the fact that you know, I think that the idea that 
some people have got ice in their veins, um, you know, is, is a bit of a nonsense. You know, I think the guys that do the best under pressure um, are simply the ones that recognise what's happening to them when they get under pressure, recognise that physiological differences and, and psychological differences occur when you're full of adrenaline and, you know, when it starts pumping. They recognise that quickly and then they uh, have identified what it is they need to do differently in order to be doing things the same. <laughs> if that makes any sense, you know, um, yeah. you know, for me, certainly it was, you know, I, I think I was quite quick to recognize when I was, you know, when there was adrenaline starting to flow and, and, and to what extent I needed to slow down. Um, you know, for me, the golf swing had to feel longer and slower when I was in that situation for it to be the same. If it felt normal, then it was short and fast. <laughs> yeah. um, that was what, um, the nature of it, or the nature of certainly the way adrenaline affected me. So, um, so I was, you know, if I, if I was good at anything, I think it was it was I was quite good at recognizing when that was happening and not becoming um, uh, too phased by it. And and as a consequence, I, you know, I generally did okay um, when I was in that space. And um, and because not everybody does that. If you do okay when you're in that space, then probably things work out better than they do for a lot of people. And, um, but yeah, I can, it's interesting the things you can remember quite vividly. I can quite vividly remember that part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's interesting you're talking right back at the start there about uh, your brother Glenn turning up with, with bruising all over him. And again, I, I listened to a, uh, a New Zealand cricketer speak one night in an after, after dinner speech. And he was talking about fear and how to channel that fear and how the very best players uh, in, 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 in his profession of cricket learn to actually overcome that fear. So to channel that fear and then deal with that fear, fear very quickly. And um, I can imagine, you know, all those bruising over your brother and the fact that he'd still, ma still managed to score four double centuries was, was probably no better example than right there. Um, hey, so 1998, the President's Cup came to Royal Melbourne. Again, Leo Barber's still stalking you because uh, he's working on the ground <laughs> stuff at Royal Melbourne by that stage. And uh, I managed to, I managed to get a get a rake and a bucket in my hand and and, and follow your group uh, in the last day. You're playing Mark Kalkovecchia, um, and 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 the singles. I, I popped my all black socks on. I had a I had an all black cap on as well, <laughs> as well as my uniform. And uh, of course, we had a rain delay there. Uh, we had a rain delay, probably six or seven holes in. And I perched under the tree just expectantly that perhaps Greg Turner at some stage might recognise the all black, the all black uh, paraphernalia. But uh, it wasn't to be. But that was, that was a wonderful event. Greg, obviously you, yourself and, and Frank uh, being selected as wild cards by Peter Thompson was, was both a, a great gesture, um, but also a very calculated move on his behalf because you, you repaid that uh, with uh, tenfold. And, uh, you know, I still remember that, that putt um, well, that that 18th hole to to kick the event off. You were the leading group out. Talk us talk us through that. Yeah, that was that was um, you know the the good thing about when you when you the when you win you get to write the history, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it turned turned out um, I was lucky enough to be at the Presidents Cup this year as well, um, or, or um, late last year, I guess, um, and. Uh, you know, still a lot of fond memories, and and I and 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 indeed, one of the preview shows they talked about in the newspapers, they talked about the the captains' picks through the years that have turned out really well, and and um, and Frank and I turned out to be that, and um, yeah, which was um, fortunate. Yeah, I, I um, yeah, it was. I mean, Tom, I took a bit of a gamble um, picking two Kiwis. <laughs> you know, there was a you know, there's a young Aussie called Robert Allenby. Who everybody thought um, Tom L I lived over pick, the back uh, fence. That's right, and 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 had had a record worth that. But anyway, Tomo for for whatever reason decided that um, or felt that the that because of the extent that Frank and I had played together in um, World Cups and Dunhill Cups through the years, that, and and both of us were in, in reasonable form, that um, that that experience would be valuable in a in a team situation. But you know, he he felt that the um, the different pressures of partnering. Um, and you know, and, and things like foursomes and four balls, um, there was a different pressure, and that because we'd done that a bit, that um, we would be well placed to 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 um, uh, to handle that situation. And, and as it you know, turned out, um, turned out all right for us. Um, 
we were actually first up for that first day, first <laughs> first match out. Yeah. Um, was uh, against a couple of guys named David Duval and Marco Mira, who I think were number one and three in the world at the time. Um, so we weren't terribly hot favourites, be fair to say. <laughs> um, and I remember Tomo being interviewed and saying, why did you put the, it was eight o'clock in the morning, was the tea time on that first morning, why did you put the Kiwis out first? And he said, well, he said, it's, um, you know, it's a couple of hours earlier in New Zealand. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so look, yeah. But yeah, I, I hit the first shot. Actually, it was force. It was foursomes, and um, yeah, I, I thought I'd, you know, you, you get on the first tee of an Open Championship at St Andrews or or wherever. Um, you know, that's a pretty excruciating <laughs> place to be. Um, so I thought I'd, uh, but I wasn't ready for uh, the Presidents Cup. I mean, that was a whole different level again. Um, just you know, because of the atmosphere, the Australians really, as you, you'll be well aware, there they really got them behind the event. It was a much yeah. bigger event than I envisaged it was going to be. It was a much bigger build-up. Um, being in a team of twelve, you know, you know, when you looked at our team, I mean, the American team was obviously um, enormous, but um, you know, when you looked at the international team, guys like Norman and VJ Singh and Ernie Els and Nick Price, um, you, you know, you're, you're talking um, greats of the game and um, so just to be in that company and amongst them on the same thing you know, was was uh, added another layer of complexity, I guess. And I remember walking out, walking through to the first tee, quite a long walk from the clubhouse to the the the, the hole they play as the first and that composite for the Presidents Cup composite. And um, and there's the twenty thousand Aussies there all started chanting Kiwi, Kiwi, Kiwi. Well, that's a bit unnerving, you know. We haven't yeah. haven't had that much support from the Aussies since Gallipoli. Um, yeah. But um, and then to walk down onto the first tee and 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 there's the welcoming group and you're shaking hands with you know there's Jack Nicholas and Peter Thompson and uh, John Howard and George Bush, so uh, <laughs> yeah, shake their hands and then you've got a hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never been so happy to see a ball get airborne and go in the general direction. <laughs> um, but it was a great, it was just a fantastic week and, and we really gelled well as a team. I actually wasn't playing that well going into it. I'd, I'd played really well most of the year and, and I was just starting to struggle. The form wasn't fantastic. Um, but, um, you know, I managed to uh, hold it together and, and play well enough um, to um, end up with a, you know, Frank and I had a great win that day and, and uh, we had a really good win the next morning against Davis Love and Justin Leonard, I think. And... Um, and then I think I and I had a half in the end with Kalkovicia, so I had a you know I could feel like I made a decent contribution. But that was one of the I mean a great course, an incredible event. Um, you know that was one of the weeks. You know, you know, perhaps the week I look back on most it was most fondest. Yeah, yeah. Likewise, Greg. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I remember just standing behind the 18th green. And watching watching the players come off, and they came over to the ground staff, and they were high fiving and thanking us. It was it was unbelievable. It was a great atmosphere. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't notice the all black. I was, it must have been in the zone. <laughs> I just I just didn't get your handshake, but I, I did get your golf ball. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, look, moving forward again, and, and, I, and I said I wasn't going to get controversial, but but the last um, time you played in the New Zealand Open uh, at Paraparamu Beach was 2002, the infamous Tiger Open. And I'll, I'll tread very carefully through this, but uh, it was controversial for a number of a number of different reasons, and I've heard different uh, urban legends on what went on. But uh, you obviously personally didn't have a, a very happy happy event. Um, stuck on Capity Road, I believe, perhaps before your <laughs> first tea time or second tea time. Oh, yeah, the whole week was a bit of a palaver. Um, yeah, it was it was a shame. I mean, yeah, it's what happens when you let investment bankers get into it. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, true. Um, yeah, look, it was you know, I I mean, it was a it was sad in a number of ways. I mean, it was it was a great idea, and it, and it just you know got out of hand. It all got a little bit hijacked. I, was, I don't I don't hold any grudges for that, or you know, I just think that um, bit of hubris, you know, and and. It, you know, a lot of people got a little bit carried away and, and probably forgot what the event was about and forgot what, um, you know, um, yeah. So, so it was pretty uncomfortable and, um, and yeah, it was, a, it was a nightmare <laughs> to try and play. And, um, yeah, we got locked out. We, uh, we couldn't, we came, the driving range was down at a school nearby. I can't remember where it was. Oh, but I'm in college, yeah. Yeah, I was playing in the group. 
I must have been playing the group in front of Tiger, I think. And uh, so we came back, and they wouldn't let the they wouldn't let the courtesy uh, cars in the onto the golf course because Tiger was due to arrive. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. like we so we had to go up the road and walk back down on the spikes in those days. You know, <laughs> yeah. oh, it was just the, yeah, it was it was the week was full of memories, none of them particularly um, happy, but um, yeah, and it was it was a shame because it, it you know it could have been uh, it was a wonderful thing to have to have him there, and and it, and and it just yeah. I just think yeah, a few people lost a little bit of perspective, and um, and you know, with the yeah, you know, and it and it sort of ended up, um, you know, I think probably financially it ended up a bit of a disaster for all involved as well. But um, so it, it didn't turn out that well. But yeah, you know, nobody died. Hey, so speaking of, speaking of memories, just to um, almost finish up, uh, your your favourite hole at Parapanami Beach, and perhaps if you. If you describe the hole as you would stand on the tee and, and as, as if you were playing it, yeah, I was thinking about this last night. Um, you know, I, I'm incredibly fond of the golf course. I think it's, I think it's underrated um, as a golf course. Um, but it's not. But it's one of the you know that whatever that expression goes about the the you know the sum of the it being greater than the sum of the individual parts. And I think that probably applies at Parabram. I mean, there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of holes that have got real merit. Um, and probably, um, uh, but it, yeah, it is the sum, you know, it's, it's, it's them in totality that kind of makes the course what it is. Um, you know, there's a, it's a great little group of par threes because um, they're all quite different, you know, and they vary in different ways. Um, they go in different, you know, they, they, you know, as a group, you know, individually, you know, I know, yeah, but probably the 16th is the one that gets the most uh, attention because it's, a, you know, like into the postage stamp. But, um, you know, I don't think any one of them individually is the best par three in the country, but as a collection, they really, you know, they make a great collection. Um, you know, 17, um, you know, I think 17 is, is, and certainly was perhaps my favourite hole there. Um, I think technology has rendered some of the interest in that hole a little less than it used to be. When it when it was, and it, a really good hit to get up on the left. Um, then the decision making about where the where's the wind, where's the pin, do I go down the right? Um, you know that that sort of thing doesn't seem. You know I think technology's rendered a little bit of that little well, that less important than it was. So it's taken away. Um, um, some of the complexity of of, of, of the decision making um, uh, that used to exist on that tee, um, I, you know, if I had to choose um, a, a, a single hole there, um, I won't. I'm going to sit on the fence a bit. You know, I think it's. I think Parapram has a great um, uh, a, a number of really good short fours. Um, I've always been really fond of the eighth hole. I mean, it's a pretty simple little green, tiny little green. Um, you, you know, you, you're just drawn to going down the right side there all the time, and it's just not the place to approach from. Yeah. Um, you know, so a hole that looks quite simple but just draws you in the in a direction. And I and I in the tenth hole, you know, the tenth is not a pretty golf hole, but 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 again, it's 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 just uh, any any time you stand on the tee. And you're thinking um, uh, that you know any club in the bag from a five iron up could be the right shot to hit. Then that always intrigues me. And I think ten's a great little hole. It's, it's not the prettiest little hole. You know the the architecture on the left side is not the, <laughs> uh, it's not country club architecture. Um, yeah. it, it's a, you know, but it's a fascinating little golf hole. So you know I and you know I love six as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, um, and, and funnily enough, and you know, now I'm, I'm going to call every hole in the golf course shortly. Yeah. You know, but, you know, um, <laughs> there goes the sum of the parts coming up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, if, you know, a hole that probably isn't a lot of people's favourites would be 15. But I've always, um, you know, it's a, it's a okay, it's a blind tee shot, um, which I don't mind. Um, it's a blind tee shot that opens up rather than closes up. But there's such a great little green location, and there is. Um, and and know, knowing where the flag is and where the wind is and you know it's it's a there's a real advantage in hitting a great tee shot down there on a hole that that looks like you can kind of hit it anywhere. Um, so um, 
Yeah. So I, I, you know, those are probably the holes that are that stand out the most for me. Again, probably a lot of people talk about thirteen. I suppose um, it's it's a hole that um, uh, that's you know it's got a great backdrop um, and it's a really strong four. I've never thought it was one of the best holes on the golf course because it just it never seemed to you know you just got to have two good golf shots. <laughs> yeah. it, it you know it was it to me it, to me thirteen was just a test of execution. Um, not taking anything away from it, but I mean, it's a good hole, but I just never felt as, I, yeah, you know, I, I, I think people probably think of it more because of the backdrop, um, with, you know, as you or, turn or, back to the hills. Or, or difficulty, it's an old argument. Is it, yeah. You know, does a difficult yeah. golf hole necessarily make it a great golf hole? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as I said, it's a good hole. I wouldn't, I, would, I, I don't want to, um, take anything away from it, but it's never it never occurred to me that it was one of the best or more memorable holes um, at Paraparana. But um, and eighteen, you know, eighteen's a uh, I'm I'm a, I much prefer eighteen from the from the tee as it's played um, now yeah, so, the old tee rather. So it's so interesting. I'd like to hear your thoughts on eighteen because it, it it can be quite a maligned finishing hole. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's a part four, really, isn't it? Um, well, that's days. the argument. If, if, if you call it a par four, does that all of a sudden make it a great <laughs> Exactly. You know, I, 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 <laughs> I, had a, I had a really interesting conversation with um, Peter Dawson, um, the, the former um, secretary of the RNA, when he was out here a few years ago. We were, we were discussing over a wine or two about the things in the, in the game. We, if we could turn the clock back and if it could change, what would they be? And, uh, you know, for me, par would be one of them. Um, you know, I think we've got fixated with this... Um, uh, idea of par and you know and, and it you know to me well f for one thing you know you go out and play um you go out and play uh Carnoustie on a dead calm day um and then play it in a 60 knot northerly and you and the par's still 72 <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. you know it's 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 10 shots harder you know yeah. so it's, it's just a you know it's a subjective thing anyway um but you know and, and but people yeah you know, a lot of the most interesting holes in golf are the ones that kind of don't fit Terribly comfortably into par. There, that sort of is it a is it a it's too long for a par three, but it's too short for a par four. You know, and and same with it. It's too long for a par four, but it's too short for a par five. Well, is it interesting? Is it intriguing? Does it does it does it ask you to hit different shots? Does it does it make you make decisions? Does it you know does it offer you a shot that you don't want to hit? Um, that um, it was so to me those things are more important than you know is it a par four? Is it a par five? Um, well, it's, it's interesting yeah. looking at uh, looking at Alec Russell's notes uh, up in our up in our clubhouse. I mean, he he talked about the three par fives being actually par four and a half. That was actually how yeah. he designed them. Yeah. Well, I was. I mean, I think of um, you know at Millbrook on the Coronet uh, course at Millbrook. Um, you know, f uh, five and six. You know, I've always said to people they're sort of their par nine. You know, yeah, right. there are plenty of days when four, you know, when five actually is, you know, five is the par four on the card and, and, and six is the par five on the card. But, um, you know, there are often occasions when, when, you know, when, when five plays, <laughs> plays harder than six does. So they're a par nine, you know, um, if you want to put, if you want to put par around it. But yeah, I, I mean, I just like, I just think the slopes on 18 at Parabram work better and the decisions work better from that right hand tee. I thought the tee that they, you know, trying to gain a little bit of distance that they use for that Tiger Woods Open, it just wasn't as good a hole from back there. Um, the, you know, the angles weren't nearly as interesting. The slopes didn't work as well. So, um, yeah, and again, it's you know, if you look at if you if you wanted to analyze Parabram on a hole by hole basis and stuff, you go well, you know, internal out of bounds is not, um, which is the same on nine. You know, you, you sort of shy away from internal out of bounds, but what the hell, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, you wouldn't ideally do that, but uh, if you were starting from scratch, but it is what it is and it's not hiding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, and it, you know, I, you know, whether you need it or not, it's a different question, but, um, but it's an interesting hole, you know, you, you want to, you want to make three there. Um, uh, you want to give yourself a chance of making three, then you, um, you know, especially when you've got a little breeze, as it's has been known to blow occasionally on the Capity Coast, um, a little breeze into you, then you better take a, you know, you better hit a good tee shot and you better hit it down that um, dangerous line. And, um, yeah, it's, it's seldom do you stand on that tee and not think about that. Yeah. Hey, Greg, I, I know you were um, 
instrumental in, in in the government's push to assist with tourism, particularly golf related tourism uh, for our industry, which has proven very successful and actually was was making great gains. Uh, obviously with this COVID-19 situation, uh, that's gonna be stymied a fair bit, I guess for the foreseeable future. Um, looking forward and just, just I guess as a, as a final finishing um, discussion point, just around how you see how you see golf being positioned post post the lockdown uh, as we return back to normal and and with I guess specific reference to to uh, you know maybe international tourism transferring to domestic tourism and, and opportunities there. Yeah, well, look, I mean, the international side is going to be pretty <laughs> quiet for a while. Um, yeah, it's hard to know um, what's going to happen there. I mean, the good the good news is that the things that make golf attractive to the international travelling golfer are the same things that make it attractive to the domestic <laughs> golfer. You know, there's a lot of Kiwi golfers that have tra that travel overseas to play golf that have, and have you know travel around the world that um, aren't going to be able to do so in the next um, well short to medium term probably. Um, so you know, hopefully they'll fill a little bit of that void. Um, it's going to be at a really difficult time for those venues that have been really focused on the international market. You know, I think of places like um, Jack's Point and, and Cowrie Cliffs and Kidnappers, particularly. Um, you know, probably, you know, far and away the majority of their business has been um, uh, centered around international visitors. So, so they've got some real challenges in the over the next 12, 24, 36 months. Who knows how long? Um, uh, that said, I think from from other perspective, if people have got a, um, you know, everybody's got a little bit of a fright. I think um, I think we've, you know, it's become patently clear, or or we've been we've we've been thrown out of our little comfort <laughs> zone. Um, and and I don't mean necessarily in terms of people feeling like they're under threat physically. Um, I think most of us feel like you know. Probably, um, you know, um, you know I, I don't, for, for one, I don't sort of think I'm in danger of COVID-19 um, taking my life in the <laughs> next short term, fingers crossed. Um, but, but I think we've been shaken out of our bubble in terms of thinking that we can just go in anywhere and do anything and, and that, um, that the life we've known over the last 20 or 30 years is going to be the same or necessarily has to be the same. So, so if, you know, that could make us a little bit more thoughtful about what we do and how we live um, here in our own backyard. So in a funny way, it might work really well for golf clubs. You know, look, you know, golf hasn't been struggling, but club memberships have been struggling. Um, so people are still wanting to play golf and they're still enjoying the game. They just haven't been engaging in it in the, to the, in the same way that I guess they have traditionally. So, you know, this may create more of an, imp an impetus for people. Well, actually, I'm not going to go overseas in the next couple of years. Um, mm. Maybe there is more value in that golf club membership than than I perceive. And 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 maybe I'll, you know, and and golf's one of those games that I can keep. Um, you know, even even in a time of, um, uh, you know, in these sort of uncertain times, once you get back on the golf course, golf is the sort of game that that does make you slow down a little bit, that, that does involve exercise, that does involve um, camaraderie and, and, and social interactions. And, um, so I, you know, I kind of think that um, in a funny way, um, this thing might um, actually help, um, you know, once it's, once it's, you know, once we're back out there, might help um, um, a few struggling clubs to actually perhaps build their relationships with the players a bit more. Yeah, excellent. I, you know, I, I think golf's got the opportunity to be in a, in a really good position post the lockdown or post, you know, some, some le further levels down to um, play a, a valuable role in, in, you know, that recreational and, and um, I guess escapism that we'll all be looking for. <laughs> and, and in, in a period of social distancing, we can, we can likely do that quite safely. So. Um, well, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast from a, 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 a American podcast from a, 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 a guy a doctor in the states who has some extraordinarily interesting uh, people on but he was talking to a guy who's a virologist epidemiologist specialist what have you dealt with all of the major outbreaks in the last 20 years but he was talking about um mental health and and about how we um uh and it, well and 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 about the fact that you you've got to take time out to, to 
get away from work sometimes and actually think. And he brought up the fact that every president in, in, in his lifetime had uh, played golf in America. Mm -hmm. And he felt the reason that they played golf, one of the reasons they played golf is it took, it actually takes you away and gives you a chance. There's nothing, you know, it gives you a chance for three, four, five hours to actually get away and get your mind away from this, the extraordinarily stressful and um, environment that obviously someone like the president of the United States would be in. Um, and, and that kind of, you know, that applies across most people's um, spectrum. And maybe this having to slow down and, and, and be a little bit thought, more thoughtful and not be breakneck speed. Maybe it'll give people the time to pause and think, well, actually that four hours or three, three or four or five, whatever time it is that you spend out there at a round of golf is a great, is therapeutic, not only from, you know, from the walking and chatting and socializing perspective and the, and the sport perspective, but it's actually therapeutic in terms of, of, of getting you away from worrying about the, the, the stuff that um, you've got to worry about in your, in your work and your, in your, in your private setting. Well, Greg, I uh, look forward to sharing a game of golf with you again, hopefully at Paraparamu Beach. Um, always good to talk to you. Thanks once again for those Turner tips. Um, absolutely valuable. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to come out of your bubble, so to speak, virtually and, um, and, and share some, some, some great stories and yarns with us today. So uh, really appreciate it, Greg. Thank you so much. It's always good. Always good to talk. We'll, we'll see you on the links. Hopefully not too long. Cheers.